I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Recently, I wrote a newsletter article about the comparison between 1918 and 2018 famine levels. And that even with all the changes in the past hundred years and the added help of the media and celebrity attention of the 80s and afterward, the famine levels are the same now as they were then. The most amazing part about that story is the fact that the largest pandemic in recorded history, the Spanish flu, occurred in 1918, which added to those statistics. It was a stark contrast of how even with all the fundraising from Live Aid and songs like We Are the World, we couldn't reduce that level of famine around the world. However, it did create something that began in the 80s. It started a time and a new effort toward unity. It was a call for all people to do something regardless of the societal barriers, barriers created by humankind over the course of time. We were called to look outside our cities and even our countries to seek and serve those in need. While all the numbers are still alarming, there are organizations like Rise Against Hunger who see a path clear enough to actually put a date on when they could end famine in the world. For them, it's 2030. Wow. I thought that was pretty stunning to think that in another 12 years, they could end famine. I started looking back and I realized 12 years ago, I was getting married. And 12 years ago, my call to ministry, the reason I'm here today, was as unclear to me then as what it would feel like to be married. And now, I can't even fathom what it would be like not working as a priest. And as you all know, truly and completely, I can't imagine not being married to my lovely wife. As you know, like hand in glove, I couldn't do what I'm called to do without her love and support. Like those calls for unity in the 80s, Rise Against Hunger recalls that cry of unity, but they added something else, a plan. Rise Against Hunger calls us to unity with a plan and a goal, not simply asking everyone to just throw money at the problem, but asking people to give up their time, their talent, and their treasure, because their plan is to use all three. Anybody recognize that plan? Ring a bell? And no, this is not a stewardship sermon. <laughs> However, their message is exactly that. With enough time, talent, and treasure being given, their plan will, as they say, end famine by 2030. Now, for everyone who was at least in high school in the 80s, they may recall that there were plans to end famine then. And while great strides were made, something happened that changed that singular focus. Like the 1918 famine, something else rivaled hunger in the 80s. It was disease. The world faced a new and different potential pandemic in the 80s. It was HIV AIDS. The difference, all the unity that was building was suddenly fractured. Sadly, I believe that if the world had unified like they did in 1918, both famine and AIDS could have been contained far more quickly. As we also know, after 1980, 1918, excuse me, the war to end war paused for only about 20 years until the second war to end war began. But there was something else that came out of all that unity that was created in 1918. The Christian church recognized their own need for unity. And by 1920, had organized a worldwide meeting of all the branches of the Christian church. 
Its goal was an effort to find a new way for unity in all the churches. Unlike war following war, 20 years later, after the 1920 conference, the World Council of Churches began and became a new way forward in unity. This was not done in an effort to go back to a single church or ancient Catholicism or even an attempt to go back to the book of Acts, but it was in a, a goal to move forward. Today's Old Testament reading and the psalm relate the story of God providing bread and even quail to the Israelites in the desert after they escaped Egypt. Now, we know that this was not just about the bread, but about mending that broken relationship with God. And yet, even as their mouths were full, they wanted more and began complaining. We don't see it in our readings, but it happens just after. The, that work of those churches that I mentioned began in 1920, and they found a way forward, not backwards, a way forward in unity. God called those Israelites to a new way forward, out of Egypt. Yet, until they could actually see it, they wandered the desert for some 40 years. Jesus, as well, called the people to a new way forward by reminding them of that first call from God to unity and the manna. He fed that multitude and tried to get them to see, as well, it was not about the bread or about going backwards to a second feeding or even another exile. It was about finding out what they were truly in need of, what they were truly seeking. That same thing, reunity or reunion with God. Not bread for a day, but the bread of eternal life in him, by him, and through him. Thanks be to God for Christ loving us that much. Paul, in all his wordiness, captures it too in today's passage, but it's almost buried in the Ephesians. In fact, you could read right past it if you're not careful. It begins, until all of us come to the unity of the faith, then we must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine. Now we also need to remember who calmed that wind and the seas. Jesus. And finally, verse 16, in love. All together, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and are no longer children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, but unified through love. I'm going to ask you to consider something that's going to feel like a left turn. Where was Jesus born? Ask, why there? Why Bethlehem? Because of the taxes and the census? No. We know Christ came into the world in love to bring all God's people to unity and out of the slavery of sin and of death. Our passages today show us that with love and for the sake of unity with God, God fed the Israelites the bread from heaven. Jesus showed them once again in love and for unity. He could feed the multitude bread for a day or for as long as he wanted. He used that example in order to show who he was and why he was there and where he came from. Now here's the point. If we were there with him, spoke the language, and asked the questions from today's gospel about what sign Jesus would give them, and then after asking the question, it shows they even recount the manna story themselves. Jesus tips us off to something very important, a phrase that says, pay attention. Very truly, I tell you. No matter what comes after that, it's important. Be alert. Jesus says, for the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The interesting thing is, Jesus was always answering questions by asking a question. And this time, this one time, I just wish 
he had asked one question right after they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. One simple question. Where was I born? It's pretty straightforward. In fact, nowadays, it's even one of the top password security questions, right? The answer to the question for where Jesus was born is simple, right? It's no trick. In Bethlehem. Now, as I said, if we were there at the time of Jesus, the reason for the question and answer might even be clearer. The answer is still Bethlehem. Now, then it was not pronounced the same way, and I'm sure I'm not going to get this perfectly, but it was pronounced Beit Lechem. For all of us, and for the unity of the whole world, that word, Beit Lechem, is the answer. And if they thought about it, it would have been clear. You see, Beit Lechem means house of bread. The house of bread, God's house, come down from heaven to Bethlehem. Jesus is from both of the houses of bread, in heaven and on earth. In order to be the bread of life for the world in unity and in love. And once again I say, thanks be to God. Amen.